Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Also, just a quick note that submissions for the Zibby Awards are open and will close on September 15th. Go to zibbyowens.com and you will find the Zibby Awards open submissions where we celebrate all the under-celebrated parts of a book, like the best spine, the best author's note, the best table of contents. And authors can nominate their own best publicists, best editors, and so on. There will be an in-person award ceremony in October in New York. You will not want to miss it go to zibbyowens.com. Maddie Friedman is the author of Who by Fire, Leonard Cohen in the Sinai. Maddie is an award-winning journalist and author. Born in Toronto and based in Jerusalem, he's a frequent contributor to the New York Times opinion page. Friedman's last book, Spies of No Country, Secret Lives at the Birth of Israel, won the 2019 Natan Prize and the Canadian Jewish Book Award for History. Pumpkin Flowers, A Soldier's Story of a Forgotten War, was chosen in 2016 as a New York Times notable book and one of Amazon's 10 best books of the year. His first book, The Aleppo Codex, won the 2014 Sammy Rohr Prize and the ALA's Sophie Brody Medal. Welcome, Maddie. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Who by Fire, Leonard Cohen in the Sinai. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you for so many reasons. One, because I've gotten to know Cindy Spiegel from Spiegel and Grau pretty well, and I really adore her and think she's awesome. So I'm very excited to hear about your journey with another sort of entrepreneurial venture in the publishing world. And also because, as I just mentioned, I I actually listened to this book, which I found fascinating, and you've gotten me through several workouts. So thank you for that. And I didn't know this whole history as most people didn't. So why don't you start by telling listeners a little bit about your particular fascination with this topic and how it became a book? Sure. It's hard for me to imagine working out to Leonard Cohen. That just seems kind of like a bit of a downer. I'm not sure if it would really get your, uh, you know, your heart rate up. When I listen to Leonard Cohen, I kind of want to sit back and ponder, you know, fate. So I don't know, did it get you? Was it good in the the gym or not? I must say I did not run very fast. (laughs) (laughs) I was kind of dragging myself, but I would have been dragging myself anyway. So, you know, it fit it fit the, the my pro, my feelings about working out. So there you go. Okay, good, good. Uh, the book I grew up with Leonard Cohen just because that was my parents' music, and we used to play it in the car all the time. And I'm, I'm Canadian. I'm from Toronto. So, um, if you're Canadian, you grew up listening to Leonard Cohen, and and I I did, and he was kind of the soundtrack of you know Canadian childhood. And I don't even remember listening to him on purpose until I was an adult. He was just kind of always on in the background songs like Suzanne and so long Marianne and sisters of mercy and flame famous blue raincoat. And those are all just classics that are always on. But the idea for the book really came in 2009. By that time, I'd been a journalist in Israel for a long time. I moved here when I was 17 from Toronto. And in 2009, Leonard Cohen showed up for a concert as part of that great kind of resurrection tour that he did as an elderly guy. He was in his seventies and he'd been in a Zen Buddhist monastery for a while. He kind of disappeared and then discovered that a former manager had stolen all of his money. So he had to go back out on the road. Initially, it was just a way to make a buck. And he kind of goes back out on the road and discovers that he is massively famous and beloved and people are thronging arenas all over the world to hear his music. The last concert on that first stage of the resurrection tour was in Tel Aviv. And and I was here at the time and I just couldn't understand why Israelis were just losing their minds over Leonard Cohen and people were willing to pay anything to get tickets and the phone lines crashed when the tickets went on sale and 50,000 people came to see Leonard Cohen in a country that's basically the size of New York City in terms of population. So, you 
you know, it was it was a big deal here, and I and I didn't really understand why. Like I understood the connection between Canadians and Leonard Cohen, and I know that he has a very you know um, fervent audience in the United States and across Europe, but I couldn't really understand what it was about him in Israel. And then I read an article about this moment in 1973 that that all Israelis seem to know about, even though the details weren't weren't exactly clear. And and the moment was a strange concert tour that he'd given in the middle of the Yom Kippur War, where he seemed, according to this article, he seemed to have shown up at the very tip of the Sinai front facing the Egyptian army in this war that was maybe the darkest moment in Israel's history from the moment that it was founded. And, And he played a concert tour. And that moment just seemed you know, ripe to be unpacked. I told myself at the time that someone needed to write a book about it. And eventually it took some time, but eventually it was, it was me. I think all these things where we're like, somebody needs to write a book about that. Everybody <laughs> should write those ideas down and just go write the books. You know, people who aren't writers, I don't think, think that, think that all the time, you know, so much read book about this. This would be a great book. But anyway, <laughs> but it's interesting because you describe how hard it was at first to even find any information about this, that he wasn't forthcoming about this period of time in his life. And then you got access, I guess, to some really interesting documents. And you thought at first they were fictitious, right? He was trying to write a novel about this, but then in the manuscript, but then you realize like it must have been based on this time period. And then you got, and then you actually included a lot of the information, which was amazing. So tell me about that and how you even got hooked up with that. Right. So in the audiobook, the parts that are written by Leonard Cohen are actually read by an actor who sounds a lot like the young Leonard Cohen. So it's, yeah. it's an interesting book to hear in that regard. My first act when I started to research the book was trying to put together the Israeli side because I understood that this book was going to have two halves. There's going to be the Leonard Cohen side and there's going to be the side of the Israeli soldiers who saw Leonard Cohen in the desert at the worst moment of their lives. So I set out to find Israeli soldiers who'd seen him and hear about these concerts. And I tried to find video of the concerts. There's no video. I tried to find audio of the concerts. There's almost no audio. It's really kind of subterranean history. It has to be put together with interviews with people who are now in their 70s and photos and private photo albums. And that's really what I spent a couple of years doing. The other side of the story was Leonard Cohen. How do I find out what Leonard Cohen was thinking? What was he doing here? Why did he come? Mm -hmm. How did he experience it? He made almost no public comment about it afterward, which is also interesting in itself. And um, when I started to write the book, Leonard Cohen was actually alive. As I started thinking about this book in 2009, and it took a few years to get it going, but but I was thinking about it, and Leonard Cohen was alive and giving interviews. And in the fall of 2016, I figured out that my Canadian publisher, McClellan and Stewart, is also Leonard Cohen's publisher. Mm. And I said, okay. And I sent an email to my editor saying, can I interview Leonard Cohen about this? And he said, sure. You know, I don't see why not. And I said, and like, really? Is that really possible? And he said, yeah, just put a, a like a summary of your book idea in an email and I'm going to get it to Leonard Cohen's people and, and, and we'll make it happen. And I was thrilled. I just didn't think that would, was possible that I could go meet Leonard Cohen. And I already had this imaginary scenario where I'm sitting with him in his living room in Montreal, sipping whiskey as we discuss the Yom Kippur War. By that time, Leonard Cohen had lived in Los Angeles for decades. He didn't really live in Montreal, but this is a completely imaginary scenario in my mind. This can be the historical novel that you write next. That's right. That's exactly. That's okay. yeah. So then I sent this email and um, went to bed really excited about the possibility that within a few weeks, I might be meeting Leonard Cohen. I woke up the next morning with an email from my editor, Doug Pepper, and the subject line of the email was, holy shit. And the email was just a link to the obituary because Leonard Cohen had died, basically, as I sent the email. So that, of course, eliminated any chance that I was going to be able to interview Leonard Cohen. But then, (laughs) through a fortuitous uh, confluence of events, I discovered this manuscript that Leonard Cohen had written. It turned out that immediately upon returning from the Yom Kippur War in the fall of 1973, he'd sat down with a typewriter on this Greek island where he lived at the time called Hydra, and he cranked out this 45-page manuscript, which is weird and raw and obscene and unedited and unfiltered. And he just kind of poured out his very contradictory and very kind of upsetting memories of what had just happened and then ultimately didn't publish it. So it sat in in a box and I was lucky enough to find it at a library in Hamilton, Ontario, (laughs) the library of McMaster University, uh, which is just a couple hours outside Toronto. And thanks to an intrepid librarian who dove into the stacks and pulled out this manuscript, scanned it and sent it to me, 
I got this incredible window into Leonard Cohen's mind. And we get to hear in the book, the man himself telling part of, telling part of the story in his own very distinctive voice. Wow. Well, the way that you, the way that he introduces it, really leaving the island and traveling paints such a vivid picture of what it was like in the days when the war started, how everyone, I think you compared it to, I don't know, some sort of like emergency alarm where everyone around the world, like put down what they were doing and they were like, we've got to get to Israel. We have to help. Eye doctors were just like hearing the news and running to the airport. The airports were a zoo, like unrecognizable. And everybody, you know, everyone, everybody who came, you said needed, uh, or he wrote, and was only, you were only allowed on the planes if you could help in some way, if you could be in a tank or you could help or fight or whatever. And even civilians were not even allowed in at that point. But the moment just felt so like I, the way that he wrote about it and then that it was in the audiobook felt just like, you know, the, like this mad rush, right? Like that the whole world was mobilized. Anyway, tell me, tell me more about that. Right. So it's this incredible moment. I mean, I guess we have to remember that Israel in 1973 is seen very differently than it is now. So it's not, I mean, it's a country that's barely 25 years old. It's barely 3 million people. We're still very much in the post-Holocaust world where people Mm -hmm. really remember what just happened. And Israel has a lot of sympathy and people feel concerned that, you know, that the country could be in, in danger, in kind of mortal danger. And in those days, it was kind of like the bat signal. So when there was a crisis yes, in the Israel, bat signal. Like the That's bat signal. Signal. sorry, sorry. And, I knew it was something better than I could remember. And then, so, and then for some people, it was, you know, like, where do I, where do I sign up? Kind of like mm-hmm. the volunteers, I'm different, but in some ways, like the volunteers have gone off to Ukraine, but mm-hmm. you know, it's particularly for Jewish people in, in the diaspora, like my dad, my dad, you know, remembers just being galvanized by by the crisis and people were really worried. So there's a lot of pressure on, on airplanes going to Israel. People are kind of sleeping, hundreds of people are sleeping on the carpets at Heathrow um, in LaGuardia, trying to get back to Israel, mainly Israeli men trying to rejoin their reserve units. And also, um, you know, and I give in the book, examples of American Jews or Jews from South Africa and some people who weren't Jews, but just wanted to help, who heard the news on Yom Kippur, which is this very solemn day when many Jewish people are in synagogue, but the news got around. And some of these uh, doctors took their operating instruments, got on an airplane and went off to to help. Some of them landed at the airport in Tel Aviv and were immediately taken to the front. The first week or two of the war were really desperate. The army almost loses the war. And ultimately, 2,600 Israelis are killed in the war in a country that is, again, just barely 3 million people. So it's a major catastrophe in Israel. The trauma of the war in some ways has never really um, dissipated. It kind of still goes on to this day, but that moment of, of the outbreak of war really kind of really galvanized people. And one of the people was Leonard Cohen, who is kind of, he feels like he's at the end of his career. He's kind of played out. He's announced that he's retiring. He's in an unhappy relationship. He's a new father. His, his first son, Adam, is one year old and he's 39 years old. So he's feeling he's kind of on the cusp of a, of a midlife crisis or maybe deep in a midlife crisis. And, uh, you know, of course, in, in those days, a rock star didn't make it to 39. Most of the, you know, the cool thing to do was die at 27, which is what Jimi Hendrix had done and Jim Morrison and Janis Joplin. And 39 was really old. So Leonard Cohen was kind of over the hill and he felt like he was done. And then this war breaks out and surprising everyone, including himself, he walks out of this little kind of fisherman's cottage where he was living on Hydra and he walks down to the docks at Hydra and he gets on a ferry to Athens and then he boards an airplane into this total catastrophe and ends up, you know, embarking on what I think is one of the great, and it's a great moment in Jewish history for sure, but it's also one of the strangest moments in the history of rock and roll. (laughs) Very true. Oh my gosh. Can you give like the one to two sentence summary for people listening who don't know what the Yom Kippur War was or even the importance of Yom Kippur in the Jewish faith, which you also, I mean, even the, like even hearing the prayers of, like there I am, like walking in Central Park, like here I felt like I was in in temple, like listening. Anyway, could you just give like the two minute background for people who might not know what we're talking about? Sure. So Yom Kippur is the most solemn day of the Jewish calendar, and it's called the Day of Atonement. It's the day when you're supposed to atone for the sins of the past year and look ahead to the coming year. And we understand in the Jewish tradition that. It's on Yom Kippur that our fates are sealed for the coming year, and the and, and you fast from the evening before to the to sundown on the day of Yom Kippur, and the fast day ends with a prayer called the locking, which is when 
according to the tradition, the gates of heaven are locked. And then, you know, you better get your atoning done by that time um, because God is sitting, you know, and, and according to some of the prayers of Yom Kippur, God is, you know, deciding your fate and expecting you to look into your own heart and, you know, get yourself in order ahead of the coming year. So that's, that's Yom Kippur. And in Israel, it's a day when everything shuts down. There's no there are no cars on the roads. There's no radio. There are no flights. There's no television. It's a day where the country goes completely quiet and most people are fasting and many people are in synagogue. And at 2 p.m. on Yom Kippur, a war breaks out out of nowhere. Israelis were not expecting it at all. The Egyptians carry out a surprise attack across the Suez Canal in the south, and the Syrians carry out a surprise attack onto the Golan Heights in the north. So Israel's attack on two fronts caught completely off guard. The borders are barely defended because the army had really been caught with its pants down, and hundreds of soldiers who are defending the borders are killed on the first day. The borders are overrun, and it does look for a while as if the Israeli army is not going to be able to win the war. And for Israel, this is kind of an existential moment. You know, Israel's existence is, is fragile. The World War II is a very fresh memory, you know, it's 1973. So these events were not, you know, they'd happened less than 30 years before. And many of the people in Israel were alive um, for the second world war and for the Holocaust. So it's a moment pregnant with religious meaning because of the day of atonement. And it's a moment of really kind of existential fear for Israelis. And that's the way the war is remembered to this day as kind of a, a mix of the holy day Yom Kippur and the war Yom Kippur and the tragedy. And it's all kind of mixed up. And Leonard Cohen, who's an outsider, just walks right into that big mess and somehow makes himself kind of a permanent part of the way this country remembers that war. Wow. Can I ask a really stupid question? Are there any movies about the Yom Kippur war to like make it more mainstream in the way that other films have done for other wars? That's an interesting question. Because I can't, th- I can't think of one. And Yeah, you know. that's a great question. I don't think that a mainstream or Western movie has been made about, about that war. I mean, there's a biopic that's coming out soon about Golda Meir, who was mm-hmm. the prime minister during that war, yep. and who's still seen in Israel as an ambiguous figure because she's seen to have mishandled that war. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's, I, I'm not sure what um, place the war plays in that movie. There's an Israeli movie called Kippur by a director named Amos Kitai, but I don't know if any hmm. mainstream Western, oh, I'm not forgetting one that's, you know, <laughs> I'll remember when we're finished no, with no, the podcast. No, no, I mean, I, th- I think um, it, you know, for something that it was such a cultural moment and really like a huge before and after, it would be more, I, I feel like it would reach more people and people would understand if there was some sort of, you know, movie star explaining what happened. But, uh, you know, okay, anyway, diversion. But we'll work on that movie later. We'll we'll get, we'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> if you make uh, one, let me know. Okay, yeah, I'll invite you to the screening. You can even bring the hairdresser who helped your wife and give you. <laughs> okay. Actually, so, I was hoping for I was hoping for a starring role. I guess oh, I'll, I'll wow. make do with a okay. ticket to the screening. Okay. Well, let, let's see how it goes. We'll see who we get. <laughs> we'll see what parts are left. Yeah. So, and Leonard Cohen, by the way, was not even particularly religious. You had a whole section about how he sort of viewed Judaism as something like like coming out of a wax museum or something. Like he was sort of, and I probably got that quote wrong too because. I didn't write it down, but but it was something like frozen in time for him and that he dabbled in it, but was sort of waiting for some sign. Like he was like, all right, I'm tolerating this, but this, it's not like he was super religious and was like raring to go. It was almost like a conscientious defector sort of joining in to a war or something, like a very incongruous set of events. So anyway... Absolutely. I mean, he grows up in this very serious Jewish community in Montreal called Shar Shemaim. That's the name of his synagogue. And he's from a very important family in the community. His grandfather had been the president of the community and so did his great grandfather. So he was from a very kind of established Jewish community in Montreal. And he grows up soaked in the Jewish tradition. His maternal grandfather is an important rabbi who's an expert in Hebrew grammar who comes from Lithuania. And he just grows up immersed in the language of the Bible and in this kind of, well, I would say like wealthy and established Jewish community and and he rejects it and he walks out on it and he says it's stale and that they've lost you. There's a very 
interesting and angry speech that he makes to the community in 1964 as he kind of departs to, for his bohemian life elsewhere. And he tells them that they, they've they lost track of what it means to be Jewish. They've lost the ability to speak to God. They've lost the ability to you know hear what God is trying to tell them. And they're just interested in, you know, social events. And it's all about synagogue dues and, you know, who's wearing what. And they're only interested in themselves. And they're not interested in the divine message that is at the heart of Judaism. And he, yeah, he, he puts it in, you know, much more elegant words that I'm doing here, but it's kind of an angry rejection of, of what, of how he saw diaspora Judaism, I think. And he, and he walks out and he ends up in the village, you know, playing with Joan Baez and Nico and Judy Collins and Dylan. And then he ends up on this Greek Island living a completely different life. It's very removed from this very staid Jewish community in Montreal where his family's in the garment business. And um, it's all very middle-class and kind of proper. And he's obviously doing something completely different. It's the sixties and acid and women and, he didn't really like, you know, follow the course that had been intended for him by his, by his father and, and uncles, but, but it's always there inside him. And his work is very hard to understand without understanding the Jewish tradition. I mean, Leonard Cohen's poetry is just full of biblical language and biblical illusions. And he always has this very deep affinity for the, for the Jewish people, for the Jewish world and for Israel. And, and that's one part of what he's doing in Israel in 1973. He's on this island when he hears on the radio that a war has broken out and, and he just needs to be there. And it's unclear exactly what he intended to do once he got to Israel. He didn't intend to play for soldiers. That's quite clear. That happens afterwards, almost by mistake. He just needs to be in the country to help somehow at this moment of, of crisis. So he has a deep Jewish affinity, even if he has a kind of skepticism about Jewish communities and, and, and skepticism about the state of Israel, by the way. Like he doesn't, you know, as you know from the book, he doesn't leave Israel waving the Israeli flag and singing the national anthem. He has very ambiguous feelings about all of it. But deep down, he has a tribal affinity. And the story of this war is in many ways a story of Leonard Cohen struggling with his tribal affinity <laughs> versus his understanding that he's a universal poet who can't be part of one tribe and has to address, you know, the soul of humanity. And you really see him struggle with those questions as the war progresses and as he writes songs in the war and inspired by the war afterward. Wow. So let's go back to you for a second. You're a father of four in Tel Aviv, and you've somehow ended up with a book coming out from a small New York City publisher. How did this happen? How did you link up with them? Just go on. <laughs> First of all, I have to I have to say that I'm I'm in Jerusalem, not Tel Aviv, which oh, for I'm Israelis so sorry. is a very I am so very, sorry. For I, Israelis, I it's a saying. very important distinction because tel, people from Tel Aviv are much cooler than people from I Jerusalem. Am, so I, you know what? I don't know why I said that. I apologize. No, I'm sorry. It's they're literally you know a half hour drive from each other, so it's like you Still, know Brooklyn. I mean, it's like Brooklyn and Manhattan. Okay, but fine. as as a Jerusalemite, we're very proud of being here, even though- I am in we, Manhattan we were, too, so I, I get it. Yes, anyway, okay. Even, even though we, we recognize that the people in Tel Aviv are cooler than, than we are. Yes. Um, I uh, grew up in Canada, moved here when I was 17, intending to be here for a year. That was 27 years ago. And since then I worked in agriculture and I spent three years in the military, which you have to do here after high school, and then studied Islamic studies and became a journalist and spent most of my time as a daily journalist working for the AP, the big US news agency. And then about a decade ago, set off on my own to do independent journalism and write books. And I've written four. Um, one is called the Aleppo Codex. And it's about, a, it's kind of a dirty story about the most important copy of the Bible. It's all nonfiction. Uh, the second book is called Pumpkin Flowers. And it's a military memoir about a weird war that I blundered into as a Canadian teenager coming to Israel in the 90s. The third one is called Spies of No Country, which is about Israel's first spies, but also about Israel's complicated ethnic identity and kind of Israel's cover story and the way it differs from its actual identity, which is something I'm interested in. And this is the last one, Who by Fire. And um, this is the first book I've published with Spiegel and Grau, which is new. I mean, everyone involved in Spiegel and Grau is a veteran of the publishing yes. world, but the um, as an independent publisher, it's new and it's really exciting to be part of, of what they're doing. It's a great operation and they have a great list. So I was really lucky to, uh, to get in with them. And of course, they're hardcore Leonard Cohen fans. And that was part <laughs> of the draw. And, um, you know, there's something about Cohen that, re that really speaks to maybe not everyone, but it speaks very strongly to some people. And I, I hope that this book helps people access Leonard Cohen. Like if people, if, you know, a certain number of people learn about Leonard Cohen and learn to, or, or, or fall in love with his music as a result of, of this book, I will feel that my, my work is done. Amazing. Are you doing a lot of outreach to congregations and like, how, how are you marketing this book? Are you trying to I don't know. I'm fascinated by marketing. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, I wish I was better at marketing than I am. I'm more of a reporter than um, someone who really knows how to sell. But um, yes, we've done some great events. We had one um, in New York, actually, at Temple Emanuel at uh, the Stryker Center, okay. where it was a musical event where I did the talking and a cantor named Gideon Zellermeyer performed. And Gideon Zellermeyer is well known for several reasons, but among Leonard Cohen fans, he's known for his collaboration with Leonard Cohen on, on what was essentially Leonard Cohen's last song called You Want It Darker. And he features Gideon's voice. Gideon is the cantor at Shara Shemaim at Leonard Cohen's childhood synagogue. So that collaboration is also very kind of heavy with, with meaning. And it's a great, great song. So we did that musical event. I did um, an event in LA with an up and coming musician, folk musician named Gigi. And she did Leonard Cohen. I think she kind of discovered Leonard Cohen because of this event. She's 22, if I'm not mistaken. And it was kind of a discovery for her. I've spoken at a few synagogues. I've been doing a lot on Zoom, of course, this being 2022 and the world not quite back online yet. And I was in my my hometown of Toronto. So yes, I mean, obviously there's a lot of interest in this that comes from Jewish communities just because people are interested in Israel and, and everyone knows Leonard Cohen. There's a lot of built-in interest in Canada where Leonard Cohen is just a massive cultural hero. Canadians are very kind of proud of anyone who is of global significance who came from Canada and Leonard Cohen. Well, there aren't that many, although, I mean, Neil Young, I guess, is Canadian and Joni Mitchell. I mean, there are, there are a few, but Leonard Cohen really looms very large. And of course he's painted on, you know, there's a huge mural of him on the side of a massive building dominating the skyline of Montreal. <laughs> so, so he's really big in, in Canada. So yeah, um, there's been a ton of interest in the book and uh, it's been really amazing to, um, to kind of get feedback from people who, take the story very personally, particularly in Israel, people who remember the war, I've got emails from people who saw Cohen in the war, people who really remember those days. So it's been, um, it's been a pretty wild ride over the past couple of months. It's been really interesting to see the book make its way in the world. I love, by the way, how you compare Canada, Canada's relationship to the U.S. similar to Israel's relationship with the Middle East and how there was this sort of solidarity between Canadians and Israelis <laughs> because of that. I think Canadians and Jews are both kind of, I mean, Leonard Cohen says this, they're both these small groups on the on the periphery of the empire and always defining themselves, you know, like vis-a-vis -vis the empire. So Canadians are just, just you kind know, of a small group of people just to the north of the United States, very preoccupied with the United States, with, you know, not being the United States and, and kind of very, very, I guess, tribal about anything that can be claimed as Canadian, like Leonard yes, Cohen yes. or, uh, you know, certain American comedians who are Canadian. I mean, Canadians can basically list every famous Canadian, <laughs> uh, you know, to the most random, Jason Priestley, you know, I got, Canadians just know that he's Canadian. And it's the same thing with Jews, a small group of people who have this kind of, you know, the outsized sense of their, of our own importance. And we know, you know, who's Jewish and who isn't. And Leonard Cohen liked that. He didn't think that tribal identity entities should be dismantled. He had this kind of argument or not, in his head, at least with John Lennon and the idea of imagine, which mm -hmm. is that we should yes. dismantle all boundaries, no religion, no nations, no people, no, no, no differences of language. And Leonard Cohen was very much, I think, enamored of those differences. He didn't mm -hmm. think we should hate each other or anything like that, but he thought that it was important to have, you know, a place like Canada or, or a group of people called Jews or a city like Montreal. And he thought that um, that kind of particularism was necessary in order to produce art. So I don't think he wanted to see the world lose its, you know, its uniqueness. And he didn't want us to move to this world where everything would be generic and uh, which might be where we're going. You know, it might be, we might be moving toward a world where the internet makes everything flat and we're all kind of talking about the same, the same stuff in the same language. I hope not. Leonard Cohen, <laughs> me too. Me too. Um, and I think Leonard Cohen saw that as a kind of nightmare scenario. Okay. Last question for you. What advice would you have for aspiring authors? I think my, my first point of advice would be never take any advice from me uh, because <laughs> you'll just be gravely disappointed and I just don't want to be responsible for it. But uh, I think it's important to maybe it, it relates to, to that last question, which is that many, because of the internet and because we're also involved in discussions and kind of we see online, I think there's, there's a lot of people not just you know fiction writers, but also journalists who are writing about what everyone else is writing about and thinking about what everyone else is thinking about. And the you know the stronger the group think tendency gets because of social media, the harder it is to produce anything unique and really different. And um, and, th and that is what I would say: just preserve that space where you're you're into something that's really different. If you know a place in a really deep way, 
great if you know another language, if you know another country, if you have a story that's really, really different and really unique, don't get drawn into the discussions that everyone else seems to be having on Twitter or Facebook and just concentrate on that unique thing that you know, because you know, as Leonard Cohen definitely fought, art that's worth anything is going to come out of that unique personal experience. It's going to come out of difference. It's not going to come out of some generic discussion that everyone seems to be having. And that's becoming increasingly hard as social media kind, kind of irons out all of our differences and draws us into the same discussions and, you know, kind of forces us into predictable patterns of thought. No interesting literature or art can be produced in those circumstances. So there is an element of resistance that's necessary. I think in order to write anything, we have to create a space in which we can think our own thoughts and kind of jealously preserve it. And then you might be able to write something worthwhile. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. Maddie, thank you so much. This was really interesting. The book was super interesting. I learned a lot. I have a new perspective on a lot of things. I was entertained and riveted, but you know, I feel like I took like this really interesting lecture course or something. Um, <laughs> it was great. I, I, I love that. I love to learn. So thank you so much. And it was a pleasure. Thank you again for having me. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 